Oh my god, you will not believe what book I just finished. Yeah? Gardens of the Moon, the hardest fantasy book ever. Wow, what a ride. It seems kind of soft to me. Malazan Book of the Fallen is a book that I've been meaning to read for years now, but due to its reputation as being the hardest fantasy ever created, I was quite intimidated. Fortunately for me, one of my favorite booktubers, Matt's Fantasy Book Reviews, announced that he was doing a read-along on his Discord. Unfortunately, due to exams, I had to tap out a bit early, but that was the final push that I really needed to get the series started. I decided that it would be a ton of fun to share this experience with you, and that's why I will be be vlogging as I progress through each part. Alright, so as you can see, I am done with book one, kind of, part one. I heard that Steven Erickson and Ian C. Esselmont created this world while playing Dungeons and Dragons, and I can definitely see the influence. I also heard that it was originally supposed to be a movie, or that it was pitched as a screenplay or something like that, and that's very much what it reads like, because every single chapter is divided into multiple different scenes from different characters' perspectives. I feel like I'm watching a chessboard, and I'm not quite sure what what all the moves mean, what all the characters mean. I'm really having trouble understanding who is fighting for which side and for what reasons. So I think that that's kind of what's decreasing my enjoyment because I, I'm struggling really to connect emotionally to anything that's happening, especially since I'm focused on understanding what's happening. That being said, that's not at all an issue for one character called Tattersail. The other thing that I'm really struggling with right now are all the playing cards. I understand that they're supposed to be kind of like tarot cards, correct me if I'm wrong, and that they're foreshadowing, right? The thing is, every single time that they come up, I'm just super lost. I'm really having trouble visualizing it, which is weird because the other scene scenes are very visual in my head. I am following the slideshow though and what I'm really really appreciating is the fact that in the slideshow um, the author says something like meta this is what you're supposed to be theorizing and I'm like obviously this is what I'm theorizing based on the foreshadowing in the cards. Pfft, duh. So yeah the slideshow is really making uh, this experience easier and I highly recommend that if you do end up reading Gardens of the Moon and you're as lost as I was that you do look at the slideshow because I think it can really aid you. I finished part two of this book and I have to say I do just stan it because I liked it so much more than part one! First of all, the characters were so cute and amazing and I already have so much more attachment to them than the characters of part one. The standout for me is Crocus. I think that's how you pronounce his name, um, because he's such a cute lover boy and I just, I want him to be okay. I bought into the dynamic of the group so much more than I did of the bridge burners, like okay, the bridge burners were so boring. There was not one that was a standout. And here, I'm already really liking Crocus, Marilio, and Ralic. And yeah, I'm really enjoying these guys' friendship. That one scene at the Phoenix was so sweet. And it did so much for me in terms of understanding their dynamic and friendship and really believing their friendship. Now, I will admit, maybe I'm enjoying part two more than part one because I'm finally starting to understand the book a little bit more. Maybe understand is using the wrong word, but the best analogy that I can think of is my experience so far of reading this book has been like looking at the plot and seeing the movie or whatever in my head but as if through a fog and slowly as I pr keep progressing the fog is starting to dissipate there's still that distance for me so I'm not fully immersed but the fog is definitely much more translucent I hope that makes sense also Darugistan is an amazing setting. It's so atmospheric. I really enjoyed the descriptions of the gas and how it's being funneled and because of it there's the blue flames all around. I really liked how we get to see both the underbelly but also the upper class and uh, you know the idea of the council ruling the streets during the day but then there being this assassins guilds that rule the roofs at night. I don't know, I, I already feel so much more of the culture uh, of this one city than I did of the Pale, even though the Pale segment was definitely longer than this one. And in addition to that, chapter 5 I think was my favorite chapter so far in this entire book. I'm not looking forward to going back to the Bridge Burners for this next segment.
Last night I finished part three called The Mission, and here's the thing. <laughs> I didn't enjoy this part as much as I did part two, and I don't think I even liked it as much as part one. That being said though, I think there were definitely moments in here that were better than part one. From here on out, it's all spoilers, okay? First of all, what was the mission? <laughs> was it the thing that like Whiskey Jack discusses like in the very first chapter? Because I'm kind of confused because that was only in one chapter. So then what was the rest of the mission? Like, do you know what I mean? I'm just really confused. Second of all, is Tattersail dead? <laughs> Tattersail is not dead. That entire part just really confused me because she looks at Nightchill's body and then Bellardan, I think that's how you pronounce the name, goes at her and she opens her warren and then there's like the big like explosion thing, but she's not dead, right? But then uh, Perrin, he sees her like charred rem remains, but then he sees like little bones, footprints. My theory right now is that maybe she shifted herself into the bones of Nightchill and then she created like a figure made out of the bones and then this figure walked away. I mean, we just met the Talan Imas and they're like the undead bone creatures. So also Bellardan, he's so useless. Jesus Christ, he, he's been looking for a burial site for Nightchill since like what chapter two and he's still just wandering the forest with her dead body <laughs> worst boyfriend of all time i have to say oh yes the dinner scene that was really cool that being said even though i didn't enjoy this part as much as the one in darujistan uh, it did end off with a banger of a quote, which actually made me laugh. It's between Tool and Adjunct Lorne. Tell me, Tool, what dominates your thoughts? The Imas shrugged before replying. I think of futility, Adjunct. Do all Imas think about futility? No, few think at all. Why is that? Because Adjunct, it is futile. <laughs> I, I thought that was quite funny. I felt like all the other chapters that we've had up until this point kind of functioned like mini short stories, like they all had their own narrative and I understood how the perspectives all worked together to create this one story throughout the chapter. But here, I felt like a bunch of them were so disjointed because like, for example, we go from P Peron seeing Tattersail's remains to then Crone flying around and being attacked by the crazy marionette. And I'm like, what's the relationship? Also, Caladan Brood, his name sounds familiar. <laughs> I can tell you that. I don't know what his point is. I don't know if he's for Anamander Rake. He kind of seems like he's against him, but he kind of seems like he's against the Mlazlans as well. So is he like his own thing? Yeah, I'm, I'm really lost. As I head into part four called Assassins, that's making me think of the Assassins on the Roofs in Darugistan, and I want to see Crocus and Marilio. Please, I want to go back to Darugistan. I just finished part four called Assassins, and might I say, I was correct that I was in fact referring to the assassins of Darugistan. I mean, I feel like I'm just getting better and better at this book. I'm, I'm figuring it out all right. Before I get to the assassins war, I have to say that stuff with Chalice and Crocus was the cutest thing I've ever read. It was so adorable. They have so much chemistry. I was like giggling and my feet were in the air and ah, I shipped them so hard. And you know how she laughs before she sends him away? I don't think that that is a derisive laughter. No, 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 no. I think she's like, e -he 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 -he, you know? I can't be easy to get, but I'll be waiting for you when you come, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, I thought they were so cute. I loved them so much. The way she's like, that's not where my hairbrush grows. <laughs> Loved them. Also, my relationship with the bridge burners is definitely improving. I still don't understand the hype around Whiskey Jack, but I'm starting to understand the hype around Quick Ben and Kalam because I feel like their friendship is starting to exude off the page. Quick Ben is so much more interesting after learning that he was an acolyte of Shadow Throne, but then he's now throwing Hairlock under the bus. But so. Yeah, I, I'm finding Quick Ben much more interesting now. And also that line with the demon of, will you pity me? And then he says, yes, I will. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. That was a really good moment. But yeah, so that brings me to the Assassin's War. Ah, that was so good. I don't know what it is about Darujistan, but it's just so visual to me. I love the idea of, you know, these assassins fighting on the rooftops while the blue fires uh, illuminate them from down below. At least that's how I imagine it in my head. 
We also got to find out what the plan was and I actually understood it this time, so I'm super happy. Yeah, maybe it's just the fact that I'm starting to understand this book much more that's making me enjoy this segment so much. I also have to gloat a little bit because I was able to read the chapters in full before referring to the slideshow. So I'm very, very proud of myself that I don't have to be looking at it 24 seven. Also the foreshadowing is really good. I feel like now perhaps it's turning to like smack me over the head because Erickson does want us to notice that we have these different groups of people going into the Gadrobi Hills to get the jacket dead guy right? Okay, see, I'm gonna sound really stupid if I'm interpreting this wrong, but yeah, overall, I really enjoyed this part called Assassins. I want more Crocus, I want more Chalice, and I want Quick Ben and Kalam. Ooh, and I'm also curious about Sari, because there's a bunch of people inside her fighting for, I don't know, control of the body, I guess? I don't know, that's how I'm interpreting it. And also, I'm confused, because <laughs> I really liked Cotillion at the start. I thought he was so witty, and is he the bad guy? Right? He's the bad guy. Because I didn't know that. So I'll check back in when I'm done with part five. Is there a Crocus fan club? And if yes, then how do I join? Because I love Crocus so much. I know this video is slowly devolving into just me gushing over Crocus, but can you blame me? I think that Gardens of the Moon is a romanticy in disguise. You cannot convince me otherwise. We've got a love triangle. We've got the, oh no, there's only one bed trope, you know, forced proximity. I still like Crocus with Chalice a bit more, or is it Chalice? I'm gonna sound really stupid, but I still like Crocus and Chalice more, but I just want my man to be happy, okay? <laughs> Let's not talk about Crocus, because there's so much more that happened here. Ganoes Peran, he had a very interesting storyline. So he met Anamander Rake, and Anamander Rake fought the hounds, and the hounds killed the marionette. And then, because of that whole interaction, Sari was freed from Cotillion, who I guess is the evil guy. Uh, Ganoas also touched the blood of one of the hounds and got teleported to the warren inside Rake's sword, right? Okay, question. Why did Ganoas decide to save the hounds from the Dragnipper warren? I'm a bit confused because didn't they try to kill him twice? And then what, he teleports to the war and sees doggies being mistreated, I guess, and be like, oh no, I don't want the dogs to be tortured, so I will save them. Or is he trying to like win favor with Shadow Throat, right? Because that's kind of where my head is going that maybe he's doing that, but I don't know, I'm a bit confused. So please let me know in the comments. Uh, then he joins up with Cole and I'm very proud of myself because I did see it coming that he was wronged and that Murillo and Relic were trying to help him out by kind of sabotaging Lady Sintel. I guess the big thing also that happened in the segment was Lorne and, and Tool trying to raise the Jagged Tyrant. And I, I get that part. What I don't get is why Lorne has like an identity crisis. I was very lost. I think it's all tied up in the history of the Jagat and the Talan Imas, but I was a bit lost why it caused such an emotional reaction for her in particular. So if anyone could explain that, I'd be very, very thankful. Now I'm continuing on to book six, The City of Blue Fire. That does not sound very uh, good because it sounds like Jirujistan is gonna explode. So I really hope I'm wrong. <laughs> I really hope I'm wrong um, because I don't wanna lose Jirujistan. I'll see you then. Oh, I finished the City of Blue Fire and I was wrong. Durjistan did not explode. So you got me there, Mr. Erickson, you got me there. This was a very short segment, so I really don't have too much to say other than Sorry, even though she's not possessed anymore, she's acting way crazier than ever before. We got the title of the book in the little prophecy thing that she tells us about the people being like dolphins in the water in the gardens of the moon or something like that. What does that mean? <laughs> Is it referencing the dragons that just left Moonspawn? I don't know. <laughs> if someone could explain it, please do. Maybe it's just foreshadowing for later on in the series. That, that's kind of what I'm banking on. Um, I'm really enjoying how everyone is joining up. I enjoyed the fight between Ralik and Ocelot. I feel like I haven't talked enough about Ralik yet because I feel like Ralik and Crocus and Murillo are my top three characters. But yeah, other than that, I really have no idea what's coming next. Oh, I guess I could make a prediction on who I think the eel is because I know 100% that 
this person's gonna get revealed because Marilio's like, oh, I think I know who the eel is. It's Kreppa, right? I, it's got to be Kreppa because he's the, you know, unassuming, bumbling fool or whatever. But then he's actually secretly the eel or something. Anyways, that's, that's my prediction. <laughs> but other than that, I have no clue how this book is gonna end. Good news, guys. I finished Gardens of the Moon. So let's talk about it. This section will be particularly about this final segment, and then I'll get into my overall thoughts later. The Fet was my favorite part of this entire book, I think. Especially the politicking with Ralik and Marilio's plan to get Cole back and to get back at Lady Simtal. I thought that was fantastic. Loved it. 10 out of 10 moment. As for my boy Crocus and his unfortunate not love affair with Shalice. I was rooting for them so much. And what? I don't know who this Gorlas dude is. He's dead. First time I see him, dead, okay? All I wanted was some Crocus and Shalice smut. Is that too much to ask for? Apparently it is. Crocus is such a cutie patootie. I just wanted him to be happy. Crap up. First of all, I was correct that he's the eel. I'm really enjoying him and I, man, I really want to see more of him because I'd love to know the extent of his influence and I'm sure that he's gonna come back in book three. I did have a small misunderstanding with him because I thought that he was Krull and I was like, oh my God, I'm so smart, I figured it out because I thought that since other versions of him appeared in his dreams and then Krull was appearing in his dreams that that was foreshadowing that Krull was actually Krapa. My friends then informed me that I was in fact incorrect, but that's that's okay, that's okay. I still enjoyed his segments a lot. And that kind of brings me to the cover. Is this Kroll's Belfry? Cause I actually have no clue what it is. Unfortunately, not everything was perfectly up to my taste. And it's probably just because th these things didn't click for me on a first read through. The first one was, I was a bit confused as to why Peron decided to go ahead with the plan to kill all the uh, leaders of Darugistan because I felt like that was what the Empress wanted and I didn't really understand why Peron would continue on with the plan. The other thing was that after the Fet, when the Jagat Tyrant became more of a plot point, I was very confused there as well because it felt like a Deus Ex Machina. I'm specifically talking about the Azath house. What was that? What was that? So you're telling me that in reality, the Jagged Tyrant was never gonna be an issue because a magical tree building thingy-mabob was gonna show up and imprison him anyway? I'm saying this mainly because I really want someone who can explain this in a spoiler-free way to enlighten me what I was supposed to get from it because I was just really confused during this segment and really underwhelmed. I liked the part with uh, Mamot Mamot? Mamo? Uh, Crocus's uncle, anyway. I thought that that was really well executed. I thought the ending with Adjunct and Lorne was very well executed. The Azath house. I mean, I didn't know that this was the magical tree house, but here we are. But it also has me thinking that the dead house in Malice City is an Azath house as well. So before going into dead house gates, I really need to understand that, don't I? <laughs> At least I think so. I don't know. Uh, and then we get to the Galane demon. Again, I think that it was just wrong expectations that I had going into the segment, but after we had the Fet, and then we had the Jagged Tyrant, and then we had the Galling Demon, and then blah blah blah, all these things were happening, and it just felt like another thing, and another thing, and another thing. But I didn't feel like the momentum was building. I thought that the Fet was for me like the highlight, and then it was like lesser things just kind of tagged on at the end as well. So yeah, I, I was a bit lost with the ending, Big shout out to Chip and Salty, my friends, who were able to give me a step-by-step -step of what was happening because they really helped me understand this. Those were my thoughts on part five. And now let's talk about my overall thoughts for the book. I think Gardens of the Moon is a solid starting point, a solid 6.5 out of 10 on my ranking scale. Now, I'm sure that I missed a lot, but I'd never felt fully immersed in the narrative. I really liked the Darugistan crew, but the bridge burners, maybe except for Kalam and Quick Ben towards the end, I really never felt that spark with them. Then I was lost a lot of the time, even towards the ending. And I do think that that decreased my rating to some extent, 
But figuring out what was happening was my favorite part of the book. But reading Gardens of the Moon was so much more than just the text on the page for me. It was an interactive experience. There was the slideshow, the 10 very big books podcast, talking with my friends about it. I mean, I don't remember the last time a book was this interactive for me. And that's why I really enjoyed the experience, perhaps even more than the book itself. And I think that's totally fine. And it's enough for me to continue on to Dead House Gates. Also, I didn't say this earlier, but the big reason why I became interested in the series was Steven Erickson himself. I love his interviews. Uh, the one with Daniel Green, the one with Books with Brittany. I really enjoy hearing him speak about his archaeology and anthropology past, and then how that translated into this world that he and Ian C. Esselmont built together, and the storytelling manner. In the foreword uh, that is included at the back of the book, he says something that uh, he really sees this as this one timeline. And similarly to how history doesn't really have a beginning or an ending, this book tells just a single part of that history that doesn't have a beginning or ending. And so experiencing that was very, very interesting. And I don't want to say that I'm committing to all 10 books yet, but one of the big pulls for me when starting the series was wanting to see what this author who I just, I love listening to, what he created. Anyways, that's all from me. I'll see you when I finish Dead House Gates. And if you have any explanations that might help my comprehension before I start that book, please do let me know in the comments. For now, that's all from me and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.